Welcome, everybody. This room is now having the session on contesting AI and data, uh, and data practices. If you want to stay here, please do take a seat. Uh, slowly finish up your conversations. For everyone who's still outside and can hear me, please come in now. Thank you. All right. And then we can start the session, and I hand over the mic. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for, for being here with us today. Um, in this session, we're going to speak about contesting AI and data practices. So um, uh, we want to, to speak about very practical and effective approaches to responsible data practices. What can we do to do this? And um, looking at platforms like Privacy Camp or CPDP, we see these are platforms that are not only driving the discourse on civil rights in the digital age, they uh, create the necessary awareness, present concepts, and connect people. Uh, this year's topics, Act Now, is something that really resonates with what we are doing here and uh, the speakers that we have here today. Uh, practically, to act, to do, ethics, as Willy would say, or to implement something that would work. Uh, we are here today with uh, three speakers, um, with Iris Maus from the Utrecht Data School, who's a data ethicist and runs uh, a team that implements actual data practices. Willy uh, Tadema, who's uh, the chief data and AI ethicist in the Ministry for the Interior and Kingdom Relations in the Netherlands. And Joost Geritsen, who's a privacy and AI, AI lawyer in the Netherlands and has his own law firm. Um, my name is Mirko Tobias Schäfer, and I'll be the moderator and trying to connect the talks to each other and connect to the audience for uh, discussion and questions. Uh, the session is built in a way that we will have three lightning talks by each of our speakers where they present how they help organizations to tackle issues around responsible data and AI practices and what works and what is an obstacle they see in their day-to-day -day practice. We will then have a discussion about that and include you, the audience, as much as possible. Uh, we don't have any cups to give away or stickers to share with you, so I hope that the intrinsic motivation will be sufficient to participate in this panel. So, without further ado, I give the floor to Iris Maus, who's going to speak from her perspective. Thank you so much. And uh, first of all, I have a technical question. Could we have our slides up on the screen, perhaps? Great. Thank you so much. Um, so, let me start off first. Um, my name is Iris Meijs. I work at Utrecht University uh, in the field of data ethics. We uh, work at Utrecht Data School, Mirko and I. Uh, some of our colleagues are also present here today. And what we do is we research the impact of technology on society. Uh, we do it across different domains, but our main uh, focus area is government, governmental organizations in the Netherlands. Uh, how we work is that we uh, do a lot of publicly engaged research and teaching. So that means that we work in the field, uh, we develop instruments uh, that can be used by the sector and that we in turn can use to harvest research data. Um, first, a little bit about my background. Uh, I studied law, international relations, and then uh, uh, I worked at a municipality, city of Amsterdam. I worked at an NGO in uh, digital education for children, and now I'm working at uh, Utrecht Data School as lead operations. Um, okay, so I'm uh, delving right into the practical um, implementation of data ethics. That's, of course, the focus of this panel. Uh, we will share with you lots of practices from the Dutch context, uh, specifically. Um, and first, I would like to share with you two very practical instruments that we as Utrecht University have developed and that have been used uh, for the past six, seven years extensively by the uh, governmental sector. So a few of them are already on the screen, actually. I will dive into two of those, which is the one on the left, the fundamental rights uh, and algorithms impact assessment, 
and the run on the top right corner, the data ethics decision aid, which are dialogical tools for project teams of uh, data projects to discuss ethics, deliberate on uh, ethical dilemmas, make decisions and document those decisions. Okay, so first of all, uh, the fundamental rights and algorithms impact assessment, which can, by the way, be seen here. Uh, so you can take a look for yourself. Um, it's an instrument um, aimed at government organizations that want to use uh, data or uh, digital technology, for instance, uh, algorithms to predict um, social benefit fraud, um, uh, to monitor uh, safety, all kinds of algorithms. And we really want to make sure that uh, no human rights or fundamental rights are breached. So uh, we've been asked by the Ministry for the Interior to develop this impact assessment. Let me quickly uh, go through the different steps. Of course, you can take a look at uh, the instrument yourself, but just to get an idea, uh, first, the first step is to answer the why question. So why do we need this algorithm? What kind of societal issue is this algorithm going to solve? Um, does it have a, a, a legal ground? Can, is, is it even allowed to use this kind of algorithm for this kind of problem? Then uh, the second block is uh, uh, involving uh, technology. So what kind of technology are we going to use? Is it a very complex algorithm? Does it involve uh, training data? Um, what kind of input data are we feeding the algorithm? Uh, the third question is uh, context. So how is it implemented? Because a, a very technically sound algorithm can still cause harmful effects if it's implemented in the, in the wrong ways or in a certain uh, vulnerable context. Uh, so it's about you know, what, what citizens are affected. Are those uh, vulnerable groups? Um, is there a potential for discrimination or other harmful effects? And the fourth and final part of the fundamental rights and algorithms impact assessment surrounds fundamental rights. So it's, it's really about the question, you know, what fundamental rights can be impacted by this algorithm, both negatively and positively? And do the benefits of this algorithm weigh up to the potential harms on human rights it can cause? So it really allows for you know, teams, data teams, interdisciplinary teams to uh, make these kinds of uh, decisions. Um, okay, so that's the first one. Uh, uh, the second one I would like to introduce is the Data Ethics Decision Aid, which has been around for, I think, six or seven years now. Uh, it's also in use in, in Germany, Sweden, uh, Greece, so it, it has more of a European uh, use as well. And this is also meant for um, uh, dialogue, facilitating dialogue in a project team. So imagine... Um, you know, uh, um, someone with a technical background sitting at the table, the project lead sitting at the table, uh, a legal expert or DPO uh, having a place at, at the table and, and talking about ethical dilemmas surrounding data together, um, making decisions and documenting these decisions. And all of this leads to, you know, accountability, responsibility, uh, enabling us as citizens, but also the fourth estate, the media, to ask questions and to be able to get answers. You know, why have you chosen to do or implement this uh, technology in a certain way? So that's what we've been working with uh, for the past um, six or seven years. Uh, we've seen a lot about how data ethics works in practice. Uh, how uh, organizations implement or try to implement data ethics. Uh, so I look forward on, uh, to, to sharing some of these findings with you today and also to discuss uh, these with my, my fellow panelists. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Iris. 
Well, that was some perspective from, from academia, but uh, you can see this was uh, a an, an do and research perspective because we do not only uh, think of concepts and drop them at the bottom of the ivory tower, we are actually out in the field and, and try to develop things that can be applied. And we always do so for collecting insights. So let's now turn to, to Joost Geritsen, who will share his experience as a privacy and AI lawyer working with a, um, a wide range of companies, but also uh, public entities. Uh, thank you, uh, Mirko, for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joost Geritsen from the firm uh, Legal Beetle. Um, indeed, I'm a lawyer since uh, 2010 now, uh, specialized in privacy laws and um, uh, solving legal issues uh, surrounding uh, emerging technologies. And in 2016, I started my own uh, law firm. And 2016, of course, is the year when the GDPR uh, was published. And um, my daily practice uh, consists mostly of uh, advisory work, but I also conduct uh, research. And um, in that uh, respect, um, I wrote several publications uh, regarding artificial intelligence. I think you can see them on the screen. One is called uh, Human Rights in the Robot Age, or uh, Better Protected Against uh, Biometric Technologies. And another one is called uh, Tackling Deepfakes in the European Policy Space. Uh, I also co-founded uh, the Dutch Association for uh, AI Lawyers. That's something we uh, and my other founder invented that phrase, AI lawyers. Um, and next to that, uh, in addition, I uh, maintain a newsletter. And if you subscribe to the newsletter, you can follow, um, you can get updates on uh, pending cases before the Court of Justice of the EU. Um, I was talking about the, uh, the publications, and I think they, they all have one um, thing in common. Uh, I think every uh, publication, and by the way, I, I, I write them with the uh, Rattenau Institute uh, most of the time. Uh, almost each publication ends with the notion that uh, technology puts uh, public values under pressure. And um, we send those reports, those publications to, uh, for, for instance, the Dutch government or the European Parliament and the Council of Europe. Uh, and we advise them on how to deal uh, with that pressure and how to maintain the public values. So my point uh, for now, for the couple uh, next minutes, is the following. I think that um, implementing data practices that preserve uh, public values uh, should be something uh, profitable. Uh, and I have a few ideas uh, how that can be done. And yeah, Mirko already said it, I, I uh, advise uh, companies, and my focus uh, will be on companies for the uh, next uh, minutes. But uh, let's address the question first. Uh, what are companies, because we all have ideas about it, but let's look at facts. Um, did you know, for instance, that in Europe, 98.9% uh, .9 are small companies? So those are companies uh, who employ less than 50 uh, people. Uh, and only 0.2% are large ones, and they have uh, more than 250 people um, uh, working for them. Uh, but then again, those large companies, they almost offer 50% uh, of the economic value, so they are quite uh, important to us. Uh, you can think of um, ASML, which is a Dutch uh, semiconductor company, it's very well known, or a software company like uh, SAP, also known as SAP, or uh, Agen, which is a Dutch uh, payment services provider. They are really, those are really big um, companies. And, well, do they use uh, artificial intelligence? Yes, they do. Uh, I think in 2019, uh, our National Statistics uh, Institute, and when I mean our, I mean the Dutch one, um, conducted research and discovered that uh, more than half of, of the big companies use uh, artificial intelligence. And um, in, in practice, that means they use machine learning or uh, facial recognition or uh, image uh, recognition. And yeah, this is the background of companies. Uh, a lot of small ones, a few uh, large ones, but who make the headlines in the international press uh, when public values are infringed? Well, if you ask me, that's mostly uh, the abbreviation known as GAFAM or uh, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple and Microsoft. And indeed, if you look at the, uh, the top 10 of the uh, biggest uh, GDPR fines, uh, nine of them are uh, uh, concerned uh, GAFAM-related uh, companies. Uh, in, in fact, only three of them, uh, and those are Google, uh, Facebook, and um, Amazon. Uh, 
So we have to keep in mind that if we talk about uh, companies, those GAVAM companies are not a fair representation of uh, the companies in Europe. However, all these companies, uh, being from uh, America or Europe, uh, have one thing in common. Uh, they are for profit and sometimes uh, with a mission to add a value for shareholders. So those are companies, and I, I use the phrase uh, public values a few times. What are public values? Well, you can answer that question, I think, from uh, different perspectives. Uh, I'm a lawyer, so I have a legal uh, perspective. And when I think of uh, public values, I think of the, uh, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. Um, enshrined in the Charter are uh, yeah, various values uh, translated into uh, rights. We know privacy rights, which is basically a combination of uh, data protection rights and uh, respect for private and family uh, rights, uh, sorry, life. Um, but there are, of course, a lot of other rights. Uh, think of uh, the right uh, to free expression or the right to be, uh, not to be uh, discriminated against, uh, for instance. And all those rights, which I just uh, told you about, they have one thing in common. Uh, they are not absolute. They are uh, relative rights. So that means that uh, you have to um, outweigh them against other rights. Uh, and they can be over, uh, yeah, being overridden by other rights, such as uh, rights uh, maintained by companies. Companies also have rights. Be, uh, for instance, um, the right to, free the, uh, to, yeah, to have the freedom to conduct a business, uh, the right to peaceful enjoyment of possessions, and overall, there's an, uh, an important interest, uh, namely the economic well-being of a country. And all those rights, in certain circumstances, can outweigh uh, privacy rights, for instance. Um, in practice, this means that companies uh, have to before perform a, a balancing act uh, with the, uh, the rights and the interests uh, of you, the, the citizens, people, uh, and they have to balance them against uh, their own rights. And it can be quite a hassle, but of course, thanks to uh, instruments um, like data, which uh, Iris uh, just described, uh, it can be done. But the thing is that um, uh, we're talking about data practices, uh, preserving public values, such as data. Uh, how can we make them attractive for those companies? Because yeah, it's an instrument, but the companies, like I just said, they are for profit. So, Back to my point, uh, those data practices have to be profitable somehow. And how can we make that an attractive option for them, for the companies? Um, I think, of course, there are... Hey, whoop. Ah, I, I'm astonished by my own <laughs> PowerPoint skills. Um, uh, of course, there are two simple solutions if we talk about how to um, uh, implement those data practices uh, um, at companies. One is actually a message uh, addressed uh, to the supervisory authorities, uh, enforce the law. So uh, if you enforce them um, uh, when they breach the GDPR, for instance, and you do it uh, um, uh, you do it more often, for instance, then it, it can help uh, establishing a more uh, equal uh, level playing field, uh, so to speak. Another solution would be uh, addressed to the Court of Justice. I think the Court of Justice uh, should allow uh, non-material damages, uh, to, uh, that you can claim non-material damages when uh, the GDPR, for instance, is breached. Or uh, the courts can also allow uh, competitors to claim um, uh, to make claims against each other when the GDPR are, are breached. And maybe you think, uh, is this not uh, the case right now? No, if it comes to um, non-material damages or a competitor cannot go to the court and saying, hey, my, my competitor is infringing the GDPR, uh, dear judge, uh, do something about it. It's, right now it's not possible, but in the near future uh, it may change. Um, yeah, those are two, in my view, uh, simple uh, things. And maybe you heard them all uh, before. So let's dive into the more interesting uh, stuff. Uh, what can you uh, do? Well, that depends. If you uh, work at an NGO like uh, Edri, um, I think you have to start thinking about uh, who are your enemies and who are your allies. So uh, I th in, from my experience, 
only a, really a small portion of companies are highly dubious. Uh, for instance, uh, TikTok or Clearview, uh, they don't have our best interests uh, in mind. Uh, you should focus on, on the majority uh, and seek allies uh, with them, uh, because in my uh, view, they, they are well willing. Oh, two minutes. I'm going to speed a little bit up. Um, yes, they make mistakes, the majority, like accidental data leaks, but they are not evil. And they are not uh, faceless entities. Uh, uh, humans work there, like you and me. Uh, and they, they really want to do the right thing. So what can you do? You can uh, befriend them, like uh, data protection uh, officers or other influential people for a bottom-up approach. Uh, convincing the, uh, their directors that public value-preserving practices are the way to go. So you want people within companies to challenge the higher-ups. Are we doing this ethically? But how can we make them, the uh, people in charge, the directors, listen? Uh, well, in my view, you should make public value preserving data practices uh, a unique selling point, a USP. So companies love to be inter industry leaders and NGOs uh, should help them with that. And my idea is that you should, as an NGO, invite them to co-write a code of conduct. And maybe you would think, oh, code of conduct, self-regulatory, it won't help, it's, uh, it's too vague. No. In practice, code of conducts are well respected by the courts. If you are a company who adhere to such a code of conduct and you infringe the code, then the judge suspects that you act unlawful. So it's quite a serious instrument and it's, uh, I think, quite underrated. Uh, such codes of conduct are uh, encouraged by the GDPR and the AI Act. And I think uh, they are a perfect opportunity to introduce ethical data practices. My final sentence, uh, Mirko, <laughs> because Okay, now we have a code, a code of conduct, uh, writing together with, let's say, uh, a bunch of companies. Now what? So here's my idea to put in the code of conduct at least one provision that says um, that companies only make their budget available to an AI product or um, AI service once they successfully completed certain data practices that preserve public values, for instance, data. Uh, in a company, it's all about money, and if a company... Uh, if a project is not greenlit uh, because it doesn't pass successfully uh, the data assessment, yeah, then there's no budget available and we are protected from potentially harmful AI. I have a lot of more ideas, but I'm out of time, so I conclude with this. Thank you so much. We'll pick your ideas up in the discussion. And we like the idea of connecting DIDA mandatory likewise uh, to, to codes of conduct. Uh, now we turn to a perspective from the government sector. Willi, please. Yeah, thank you. I think you introduced me as uh, being a chief uh, AI ethicist, well, but I have to It's how you come across, so it's uh, just uh, <laughs> a question of my respect. Not yet, at least. <laughs> so uh, my name is Willi Tadema. I'm a data scientist in, uh, and uh, AI ethicist uh, working for the Dutch Ministry of the Interior. My team is uh, working with uh, governments, a governmental organization trying to realize the potential of data and AI in a trustworthy way. So accountable, transparent, fair, safe and secure and without infringing um, and, uh, privacy if it's not necessary and disproportionately. So we are mainly working for uh, central governments on a national level, like ministries and uh, the tax authority and the judiciary. Uh, we provide uh, numerous services. Uh, we uh, assist uh, governments in uh, uh, designing, building, testing, deploying and using uh, AI, but we also conduct a lot of assessments. So uh, uh, fundamental rights impact assessments, for instance, bias assessments, pre-audit assessments. And we also, on a strategic level, advise uh, organizations how to prepare for uh, new legislation and policies like the AI Act or the National uh, Algorithmic uh, Register. So, but I think the, the, the main focus of our team is um, uh, putting ethics into practice. So, helping governments, um, uh, thinking, uh, uh, helping them um, doing ethics. Right? What should they do? So when I started uh, this job um, almost five years ago, um, things were like, uh, we had a lot of trust in, in, in data and AI. It was almost like 
a holy grail. Um, uh, it was going to solve all our problems. Data science and AI was very much uh, mystified, like in this picture. So um, uh, governments were setting up data labs everywhere. They were recruiting uh, data scientists. They were experimenting and prototyping. And also um, the, the data scientists, they were doing their work in isolation. And people will think, were thinking, well, we better leave those data scientists alone. We, we give them the data and, the, and we give them the computing power and then they can perform their magic. So, um, yeah, to be honest, um, of course, there were uh, data protection impact assessments being done because that was mandatory under the GDPR, but on the whole, not a lot of attention was paid to the legal and ethical risks. And also, uh, when you're, um, not a lot of attention was paid to the, to the, the, the organizational and technical aspects of, of, of testing and deploying and using uh, algorithms. Uh, and also data, data issues like data access, data quality, data representativeness. Well, that, that wasn't really a thing we talked a lot about. So uh, the data scientist was doing his work, was optimizing for accuracy and not so much for fairness and transparency and also accountability. No. Well, it was not really paid a lot of attention to. And it's not... I don't mean to bash those organizations, because I think in hindsight, it is what you could expect. It was a new technology, it was very much hyped, and of course, our, um, yeah, the, the, the organizations had a really low maturity level when we look at AI and ethics. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, but I have to be honest, sometimes it really scared me, uh, what I was seeing. But then things started to change because we had a number of scandals in the Netherlands. We had, for instance, uh, the judge ruling that the fraud, uh, uh, the welfare fraud detection system Siri was unlawfully. And of course, we had the child care benefit scandal. That was enormous. It was, it was really awful. So um, it, that was marking the, uh, the, and it was marking the beginning of a lot of new policies being drafted and uh, new instruments, new tools being developed for trustworthy AI. And of course, that is a really good thing. So where are we now? Um, okay, well, I think that, um, next sheet. <laughs> I think a lot of uh, governments now are hesitant, hesitant, maybe reluctant to use AI. I see a lot of uh, projects being stopped, prototypes not making it into production, and all this without sound reasoning, without good arguments. And that is a bad thing, because it means we are not learning. We are not learning from our failures. We, we are just wasting uh, taxpayers' money. Uh, we are talking a lot more about ethics, and that's also a very good thing. But I think it's limited to ethical dilemmas. So it's limited to the question, should we be even building this algorithm? algorithm? And once we have decide, decided that we need an algorithm, the, the ethical discussions, they just stop. But we also have to talk about um, ethical decisions. Um, the, 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 how do we translate uh, public values into design requirements, design decisions? Um, we also are still focusing on the algorithm and not on the algorithmic system. Hey, of course, it's true, a lot of uh, uh, bias can stem from uh, the, the, algorithm, uh, the algorithm and also the data. But like we have seen in the child care benefit scandal, uh, you can also um, create a, uh, do a lot of harm by using an algorithm in the wrong way. So, and as a consequence of zooming in on the algorithm, the responsibility for trustworthy AI is still put on the shoulders of the technical team. And this is also a, a really bad thing because ethics is, is something, it's, it's for the whole organization, not only for the engineers. So, uh, I think on the whole, what we, what we are seeing is that, um, yeah, Government organizations are, are overwhelmed. 
and they are they are very insecure. They um, they they need to take uh, the lead. They need to prioritize. They need to to chart a course, but they fail to do so. So they look at external parties for guidance, and that is a really bad thing, because ethics should be ingrained in the organization. It's not something that you can outsource. So what should we do to, to, um, uh, to, to uh, uh, bridge the gap with the, between uh, theory and practice? But, well, for one, we should stop placing the, the, the burden of moral decision on the uh, uh, engineering teams, on the tech, uh, technical teams. And we should, um, when we look at trustworthy AI, it's not only technical robust, but it's also legal, ethical, and organizational robust. So we should bring in the lawyers, the ethicists, uh, the system engineers, but also psychologists, uh, communication experts, yeah, many more people. And um, especially when we are looking at, uh, at high-stake algorithms, we should have all stakeholders at the table right from the beginning. So also, uh, 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 people representing uh, those groups within society that are impacted by the algorithm. We should create a level playing field. So the information position of every stakeholder should be the same. And we should pay attention to language, develop a common language. Otherwise, uh, we can have a, can't have a meaningful deliberation. But I think, well, my most important point would be um, if we, um, we need to adopt a learning approach. We need to bring the outside world in. We have to invest in people and teams. Eh? Ethics is, uh, is not something that you can buy or outsource. Ethics needs to be in the DNA of your organization, meaning the people. And uh, also ethics is um, and knowing the right thing to do in every situation. That's not something that you can learn, learn by reading a book or, or, or looking at a policy or at a regulation. It's, ethics is something that you should do and you should practice it to get better at it. And it's not, uh, ethics is not a one size fits all. Eh? We do not want uh, government organizations that run through checklists and tick all the boxes. We want government organizations that are guided by their, by their, by their values and, um, and that create and use algorithms accordingly so. So I think as a, as a government, we should lead by example. We should uh, adopt a learning approach, uh, uh, get the outside world in. And uh, well, I, 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 it's my hope that we can do this with you, with, uh, uh, with industry, with academia and, of course, with, with the NGOs. So. Thank you, Millie. Thank you. This was a, a great um, a call to action. <laughs> with an eye to the time, I... I um... Got a sheet for that? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, come on, everybody. Uh, if it's also uh, with uh, an eye to the time, we don't want to um, keep uh, the audience also from engaging with the experts here on the podium. So please feel free to, to raise a hand. Uh, there's a nice uh, uh, gentleman who's going to uh, share a microphone. Um, and there is already the first question. Hello. Thank you very much for the organization. I am a data scientist and also a master's student at KU Leuven in data science program. And in one of the courses, which is price and big data, we learned that we have a tool called Linden, developed by KU Leuven. It is similar to DIDA, I think. I, at least I find it similar. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, think, I think there will be some advantages and maybe some pros and cons of following one or the other tool framework for applying in practice. I am wondering whether there is a project or a work to merge this kind of frameworks in EU, EU because we have one law, GDPR, GDPR <coughs> which is a state of the art, I believe, in, in the world. Maybe we can come up with a one framework. Maybe there can be other 
obstacles, I don't know, but it may be a good uh, project to foster the and help the data scientists in this way. What do you think about this? Hmm? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, there are there's a plethora of uh, frameworks, deliberation methods. Uh, only in the Netherlands alone, we have uh, we have several. Uh, I mean, there's an NGO, Algorithm Watch, that collects all of these different manifestos and, and methods, and they are over 100 now. You can see them. That it's an endless list on their on their website. So I um, understand the the confusion, and uh, you know, where do you start? Which framework do you choose? Um, it's, it's very difficult and uh, I presented to you two frameworks we developed. Of course, I'm very biased uh, being the co-author of both of them. Um, but um, I think the core point of, of all of these methods is uh, an ethical deliberation, fostering an ethical deliberation between stakeholders of uh, interdisciplinary background uh, and ingraining public values or organizational values, translating them into your uh, technology design. So um, how you do that doesn't really matter. Which, which method you choose doesn't really matter. As long as you um, do it with stakeholders involved, uh, an interdisciplinary team, I think that's, that's very important to not just uh, uh, get blindsided or, or miss or have blind spots. Um, and also to foster an, a shared responsibility to not just focus on like Willy mentioned, the, the technical people as being responsible for data ethics or maybe the, the project leader, but to really share this responsibility within the organization. And also, um, what we encounter a lot, uh, we've been to over 100 institutions in the Netherlands to conduct or lead these kinds of ethical deliberations. Um, every organization has different values. So, especially in, in, in uh, the case of um, uh, governmental organizations, for instance, like cities or municipalities, uh, every four years, uh, the politicians change. So, they may have, uh, in one term, a very uh, liberal uh, um, uh, head of the, the, the government, uh, and they choose liberal algorithms. But then there's elections, maybe a democratic or you know left-wing uh, uh, party comes to power, and you should really review all of these data practices again to make sure they're still in line with the the, the values. So, um, whichever method you you choose, the the translation of these public values is is very important. And of course, there is some harmonization. Of course, we have the uh, data protection impact assessments. Um, in the AI Act, some sort of human rights impact assessment is, is probably being uh, installed. Um, and uh, it, it would be good to have one harmonized human rights impact assessment, but still it needs to leave some room for organizational values to be uh, uh, ingrained in that assessment. Thank you, thank you. Uh, you said you're studying applied data science. Yes, yes I'm, I'm, I'm managing the applied data science at Utrecht University and your question is uh, uh, awfully familiar. I get that very often from the students. So I think what, what you will recognize very often is that these ethical questions are delegated to you. Um, but I think that data scientists should, be, uh, should recognize them and assign responsibility and give it back to the organization and uh, take them on the table and say, you know, it's not only the law that regulates this, uh, as Iris just pointed out, it's also the values that might differ from one municipality to the other. And the data scientists should, shouldn't accept to be left alone with this. Maybe I can add something yes. to that because I'm also a data scientist. So I, I totally uh, understand the position that you are in. Um, and, and you were saying like, um, hey, it's, it's important uh, uh, to, to re recognize the values. Huh? And, and our, for instance, when we are looking uh, at uh, equality and non-discrimination, of course, huh? we want 
the, the algorithm to be fair, and, and we should talk about that. But in, in my experience, okay, so we are saying the algorithm should, should be fair. You are the data scientist. You check that. And it's not, not something that I was prepared for at university. So we were taught how to train models, but not how to translate fairness into a metric that we can optimize our models on. So I think this is also uh, something that lacks in, in our uh, training and education. Yeah? So, uh, and, and luckily we're seeing in the Netherlands that a lot of universities and, and um, uh, are, are um, uh, adding this to their uh, curriculum. So but I think that's also a very important point. Yeah. Um, me. Yes, hello. Yeah, but thank you very much. Uh, my name is Javier Saez. I work for Fundación Secretariado Gitano. It's an NGO uh, working against discrimination against Roma community in Spain. And I would like to ask to Mrs. Tadema if, uh, or maybe the other colleagues, uh, if you have experience on how to prevent uh, bias on algorithms, uh, racial bias. Because I remember a case in the Netherlands uh, was um, in Roermond, and when the predicting police finally criminalized Roma communities, Roma people, but we have also examples in Spain and we are trying to work with authorities uh, on how to prevent um, artificial intelligence or algorithms regarding racial discrimination. But uh, the question is, do you have protocols or ideas about how to prevent that? And secondly, if you think it's interesting to get on board the communities that can be targeted or affected um, racial or other minorities within these procedures? Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question, I think. Um, well, um, for instance, yeah, when you are looking at uh, discrimination. It's, it's, um, we don't have the, the, the awareness is there, but the best practices and the standards, they're not there. So we have to mature on that uh, level. And it's also, it's, it's a really difficult topic because when you are talking about discrimination, depending on whether you are an engineer or an ethicist or a lawyer or just a worried citizen, you may uh, assign that a, a very different meaning, discrimination. I think within law, hey, it's, it's really good defined what is discrimination and what is not. Uh, I can add something. Okay, well, maybe you can reflect on that. But uh, um, it's, yeah, um, it's really tough for a data scientist hey, to, to say, I, I, I get uh, asked quite a lot, uh, hey, can you, can you check whether this algorithm is discriminating? And it's a very, very difficult question. And it's not a question that I should answer. I can provide you with information about the bias, the bias in the data, the bias in the algorithm. Maybe we could even monitor the bias in the usage of the uh, algorithm. But whether the, the algorithm is, is, is racist, uh, whether it is uh, discriminatory, is not something that a data scientist can decide, and it's, it's something that we should do, I think, together. And we definitely need to um, develop best practices and standards, and I don't think they are here yet. So it is, this is a topic that we really want to work together with academia and NGOs. Yeah, no, for, for me, it's not easy uh, at all, or not black and white, uh, as she uh, suggests. No, I think... Uh, oh, that, that's no? not my suggestion. Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. It's, it's, no, can you refer, uh, repeat? Oh, well, I huh? think, like, uh, whether... Uh, um, uh, people ask me whether the algorithm is discriminatory, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, I think when you look at non-discrimination law, mm -hmm. it, it is contextual. It oh, is yeah. depending on the circumstance, oh, yeah. okay, well, whether then, it is yeah. discriminatory. So, so it's not something that you can measure no. or not something that you can automate. So it's really important to be aware of that. So you can't defer that decision, that assessment to a, te 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 no. a technical person. Uh, yeah. But yeah, then I totally uh, agree with you. I, sorry, I just uh, misunderstood. No, I think that the non-discrimination non law is probably the hardest uh, legal field uh, 
uh, to be active in. So last year I was invited to write an uh, advice paper, small paper, to the Dutch Parliament about non-discrimination in an AI context. And uh, boy, I almost fell off my chair. I mean, you, there's not there's not only a lot of case law, uh, but the case law is also about um, non-AI situations. But you have to somehow apply that to a modern uh, situation. Um, and what I also think what's really hard is that um, when we talk to each other and what someone says, I, uh, I am discriminated, um, most of the time you think, yeah, that's illegal, that shouldn't be done. But from a legal perspective, uh, discrimination, like I said in my uh, opening speech, it's, it's a relative right. So yes, uh, some forms of discrimination are always forbidden, but there are also forms that can be uh, justified. And that makes it really difficult that sometimes you feel, oh, this shouldn't be done, this is discriminatory, we should get rid of it. But if you uh, ask a judge, the judge will say, yeah, well, okay, but in this situation, it can be done. So, um, yeah, part of the advice paper, I dive, uh, dove in the, um, also in the academic work, maybe you know the name uh, Sandra Wachter, she's active, I think, at Oxford University. She did a lot of uh, academic papers, and uh, if I understand her correctly, she says, yeah, well, you, you cannot eradicate uh, bias in an algorithm. It, it simply cannot be done. And she she uh, has several arguments uh, for that, um, but... Uh, that, that message we tried to convey to the Dutch parliament as well, because the parliament said, uh, I think it was even our prime minister, he said, I want zero discrimination in our algorithms. I, want, I don't want anything. But we have to say to him, sorry, Mr. Rutte, uh, yeah, of course, not literally, but uh, we said, we, that's impossible, uh, thanks to Sandra Wachter, we know this, and uh, for other reasons. So our question to the politicians were, what level of discrimination are you willing to accept? And that's a really not, not a nice discussion to have, but I think a really important discussion because from my legal perspective, um, it's really hard to prevent uh, harmful AI. And yeah, it's, like I said, it's the, it's the difficult, most difficult legal field uh, that I know of. If, if I may, yeah, please go ahead. Touching on, uh, on an interesting point, which is the role of politicians, uh, which is something I, I would like to add something on. Um, so in the Netherlands, you, you see a, a, a very clear shift where at first politicians uh, were like, okay, we, I'm not a technical person, I don't know anything about technology, so please leave the decisions regarding technology to the data scientists. Um, we don't want to do anything. Uh, uh, we, we don't even have a standpoint on technology. So this has really changed also due to the, the scandal um, uh, Willy mentioned earlier. Uh, it has really awoken politicians um, uh, to form a standpoint, political standpoint on the use of technology and data ethics. Um, but the way they are getting involved is sometimes um, not very productive uh, because they might lack the, the knowledge to provide adequate uh, control over technology. Um, and that's also where education and training comes in, again, uh, to provide these politicians with the right information to adequately control and steer uh, technological developments within their, um, their organization. Um, so that's also uh, um, a development we see and, and we see uh, uh, getting stronger. Uh, so I, I highly suggest um, stimulating your local politician even to get involved in, uh, in forming a standpoint on digital technology. Thank you. There was another question there. Hi, uh, I'm Judith and I'm conducting an action research on menstruation tracking and the role of technologies. And um, so I'm interviewing a lot of people who use apps, for instance, to track their menstruation. And I'm also looking with them how they, if the apps don't exactly work like they want them to work, how they can contact the companies behind these apps and tell them, hey, can you change this maybe? For instance, uh, one person that I interviewed keeps receiving this pop-up where it says, do you want to conceive? And she really doesn't, and she has very sensitive reasons why she doesn't. Uh, so she really would like that this 
this pop-up to be to disappear, which is a really so I have a really practical question. How can we empower users to successfully uh, have some sort of meaningful contact with companies? Because now we together sent an email to this company and we got an automatic reply, which was like, we're working on our services right now. Uh, please rate us on the app, <laughs> you know? Uh, so that's not very helpful um, for users. And I, yeah, so that's my question. How can we empower users uh, to do this? Yours, can you say something from the consumer perspective? Yeah. Uh, the thing is that the, this topic is already dealt with uh, by the GDPR if it comes to data protection, uh, sorry, uh, data protection and processing activities. So, uh, yeah, you've probably heard of the data subject and his or her rights. Um, so, from my perspective, I would say, you know, that this is not a problem at all. The law is already there. But, yeah. I, I know as well, also from a personal uh, experience, I tried to, or I did actually, I sued uh, T-Mobile uh, uh, because they used my um, location data or cell phone data uh, to build uh, apps, uh, mob uh, analytical apps. And I think, yeah, okay, sure, but they did it with the government and didn't tell anyone. I just learned it from the newspaper. So I was a bit... Uh, um, yeah, excited in the wrong way. I, I, I emailed them, uh, and then indeed I recognized the story. At first, uh, I had no reaction as well. And then, okay, I'm going to tell them I'm a lawyer, and then yes, I get a response. Um, and it takes a lot of time. So even if you can find a contact uh, person, it, it, it takes a lot of time. I actually took them to court uh, because my. Um, but, but she cannot take them to court, can she? Yeah, you can. Uh, well, uh, if you are the data subject uh, yourself, you can. And of course, you have uh, NGOs specialized in uh, mass uh, class actions. So they can uh, 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 gather all those complaints. And uh, well, you can go to the court for several reasons, but you have to uh, uh, think about the, the costs involved. It, it's, it's very costly. And also the, the duration of it. It took me almost two years, and I know my way around the court. So, and then I thought, if it's quite difficult for me, the, the, how is it for people who didn't study law or who are not a lawyer? So yes, the GDPR helps. Um, also, the G, uh, GDPR says something about uh, EU representatives. So if the app is built by uh, an American or Chinese company or whatever, they should have someone in Europe which you can contact. And last but not least, uh, the AI Act, because uh, the AI, AI Act is coming first act in the world that regulates uh, technology uh, also on the level of the, the programmers. The programmers have to think about a lot of stuff when they are making AI in the near future. Uh, just like uh, you are building a project, product, now you're making uh, AI. Uh, and the AI Act also uh, has provisions on uh, you should have a contact person available, etc. Yeah, so I think I don't have a really good uh, answer to the question other than Yes, you have rights, and uh, unfortunately, they are really hard to, uh, uh, to enforce. But it is possible. OK. There's a next question, please. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm, <clears throat> I'm Fran. I work in applied machine learning and cybersecurity. I would uh, like to start my question with an anecdote. So on an occasion, I got passed down a regulatory form from one of our clients in the financial sector about they had, they had to uh, report all the machine learning models in their environment, so we had to provide some information on that. I was kind of suggested to just, for any complicated stuff, to just say down it's proprietary, so it's easier. But I found the regulatory form actually quite well written. Uh, it covered most of the best practices as someone who does his work well, I could basically give a decent answer on most questions without having to delve into actual proprietary stuff. So in the end I did, and um, the feedback I got was mostly about I didn't answer some questions, and I felt like the, the answers I did provide were not really evaluated, and they kind of focused on how, uh, if, if, they, if it's more filled out completely rather than what I actually answered. So my question is, uh, even if we do our best about uh, being open about our practices, do everything right, what is the capacity of some regulatory framework to actually evaluate and absorb uh, the information we provide about our work? 
And with regulatory framework, you mean uh, something like uh, like the fundamental rights uh, uh, algorithm impact assessment or uh, any of the other 160 on the algorithm watch list? I, I can answer uh, on that. I think you make a very, very valid point because uh, all of these frameworks, um, whichever you choose, are self-regulation, basically. So um, there is no capacity to, you know, um, have someone check if the answers are correct. Uh, and with ethics, it's a very new field. So correct is still under debate with what is correct and what isn't. Um, so I think that's where oversight and inspection really comes in. Uh, that that's. That's the, the stage in which, uh, you know, um, regulation or, or authorities, inspection authorities, should really step in and um, uh, in their respective domains, you have so many uh, inspection authorities in the Netherlands all overseeing their field. They have a lot of domain expertise. They've built this expertise and knowledge for over uh, decades, they should really also oversee uh, AI and the use of algorithms and technology within their domains. They should be the ones uh, qualitatively checking uh, what companies and, and other organizations are doing, uh, not just if they have filled out the form completely, but really look at the contents, you know, what is happening in our domain? Is that happening in, in the right way? Doesn't it har does it harm human rights or or fundamental rights. Um, and what we're seeing in the Netherlands right now, I have no experience in, in other countries when it comes to uh, inspection authorities, but we see that uh, those authorities are um, stepping up and taking their responsibility, trying to uh, keep oversight on, on AI. You have a couple of frameworks with the, which they are using already. Um, but it's it is difficult for them especially in domains you know in in domains such as the telecom industry they are very technology heavy already so they have a lot of capacities to do these kinds of of checks but in in other domains like like food safety for instance the people working at such an authority don't have any experience with you know auditing ai systems so that's really something that should be built up uh, and should be uh, formalized, um, uh, that mandate. But there's another point to it, and uh, if I understood uh, yours correctly here, the GDPR really encourages organizations to develop their own maturity, uh, to develop their own codes of conduct and adhere to them. So um, this is something that I feel across uh, the board of, uh, of our experts here today, that they really call for the development of a mature approach to artificial intelligence and data practices and to develop that within any organization. And that does not have to be uh, prescribed necessarily in detail by law. It is something that has to be embedded much more in detail into the practice in the respective organizations. So my questions to, to the panel would be, what is the next step in achieving that? Because everything you presented, there are good ideas, there are best practices we can point to. There is a legal framework that seems to be really helpful and encouraging, but what is the next step to, to actually make um, responsible data practice and AI, and AI possible? Shall I, shall I start? Um, of course, I'm, uh, I work at a university, so I'm very biased in saying that education uh, obviously plays a, a big part. Uh, not only uh, educating students, for instance, data science students, but also um, professionals working in the field right now. Uh, educating politicians, um, uh, involving NGOs also in this. Um, and, and really um, stimulating and encouraging that democratic control and, and deliberation. Um, I think that's, that's very important. And I'm, I'm sure you have a lot to add uh, to this. Well, I think, yeah, I, I agree. For me, the best thing to do now is to, uh, especially when we are looking at high-stake algorithms, 
we should develop uh, an inclusive, participatory, accountable, democratic approach to designing and building those algorithms. And, uh, well, we've done a pilot with the province of Friesland and with uh, Roberto Sicari, trying to do the first steps. And it's really hard, it's really difficult, and there aren't a lot of examples. So I would really, yeah, would really uh, love you to help us doing this. And, 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 and um, well, yeah, proceed on that way. It's, it's really important. Okay, you, you clearly make a point here for the civil society, so media, exactly. advocacy, yeah. and NGOs, and educational yeah. institutions stepping in and contributing. I've talked also to companies about this, and they were saying, oh, it's, much too, it's way too expensive, and it costs way too much time, and I, I understand hey, from Make the company it profitable. Point, yes, <laughs> but I think for us as a government, uh, like I, I already said, well, we should uh, set an example, and uh, when we look at the child care benefit scandal, well, I do think that, um, well, those costs and, and, and the harm that has done that we can't undo, they are much, much larger, so it's well worth the investment. Yeah, um, if you ask me what can we do, uh, let me start with uh, a bias I have. Uh, my bias is that NGOs are a bit too much uh, reactive. So uh, if there is an act uh, published or ideas of an act, you have all the NGOs uh, reacting oh, that's stupid, oh, that's hindering fundamental rights. And I think of probably they are right. But the problem with that approach is, is that uh, you do not set the tone. And I think uh, if you uh, start a discussion uh, or open up a debate, it's really important to set the tone. And how do you do that? Just be the first party to, uh, to draft the act. You can do that. You can do that together with parliamentarians. Or uh, if it comes to my idea of the code of conduct, you do it uh, together with, uh, uh, with the businesses. But if you want to have um, influence, you, you start with the draft on your own. And you, you go to the company and say, we already made this. Uh, also, uh, it will save you time and thus costs. Uh, and we can make you an industry leader. Come join us. Um, however, this is my bias. And if you think, uh, Joost, what are you saying? Uh, NGOs are, uh, are not proactive. Uh, feel free to uh, challenge me. So there's the question right there. I don't know whether that responds to that, but please go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Liva. Uh, thank you so much. I come from an active NGO. <laughs> um, but I had a question connect in connection to the scandals you mentioned happened in the Netherlands, and also to the fact that it's impossible by input data to fix the algorithms to make sure that they're non-discriminatory. So in your opinion, what's the right recourse? Or is there an effective recourse system that can be put in place for people who are affected, discriminated uh, by the algorithms and systems? So, yeah. so, so the, the great question. I mean, it's, um, uh, um, I try to connect it to a few things that were already said. For instance, the case in Wormont, the gentleman mentioned where the police started to non-discriminatorily uh, scan all cars approaching a certain uh, shopping mall. Um, uh, it was Amnesty International that really did the investigation and put it onto the agenda of the public discourse. That was really helpful. In the case of the Dutch benefit, uh, child benefit scandal, I would like to point out we always look at the technology here. But in the, that particular case, it wasn't artificial intelligence. It was probably a regression analysis that was carried out. There was no machine learning involved. But what we can learn from the case is that the context also matters. In that particular case, it was usually the uh, political pressure that stopped people working on the cases to uh, uh, voice their concerns about the effectiveness of the rule-based uh, algorithm, big word here, but uh, that was applied. So I think um, to, to, uh, to, to answer your question a bit, that all encompassing uh, approach should consider both technology and the social context. And the frameworks that we've seen today try to implement exactly that, to look at the developer's context of any digital system, whether it is a uh, machine learning uh, trained algorithm or whether it is just a, a form of data analysis or a, a decision tree or whatsoever, and to, to look in particular in the use context. How is it used? How do you 
uh, care about um, appeal processes, how do you deal with errors that are quite apparent, and that is something that was missing in the child benefit scandal affair, that there was no appeal process. There was no way to report the errors and have a response to that. Now, that would be my part on it, but maybe you want to add something from... Yeah, I think when you're... I'm not an expert on the child care benefit scandal, but I think... Yes, the algorithm, it was faulty, it was discriminatory, but even if it hadn't been, eh, the harm done would have been, yeah, also huge. Eh, because um, when we look at what, uh, how uh, the predictions were being used and the interventions uh, that uh, were, uh, uh, were done, and those, uh, and we could have said, uh, uh, people were being flagged as potential fraudsters and their benefits were stopped. And uh, we could have said, okay, this is a person who, who forgot to uh, file a form or, or put signature on a form. We, we can call them and we can, uh, we can tell them to correct their error. No, we didn't do that. We, we stopped their benefits. And also the, the, the predictions of the algorithm, they were being shared with other government agencies and they were being reused in a completely different context and new decisions being made upon those uh, uh, predictions. So, as I said before, we really need to look at the syst systemic level if we want to uh, control these harms being done by uh, AI. It's not enough to look at the algorithm. And to add on that, what, what we've seen over the past 10 years in the Netherlands is that any change has been really driven by two things. On the one hand, uh, the, the policy pressure coming from Brussels. So many municipalities started structurally thinking about the practices when, when the GDPR uh, was approaching. That was the moment they really stepped up the game. And the other thing was errors that were reported in the media. So looking at the digital society, we really need a force state that is tech savvy. We need a really good tech journalism that is capable in investigating uh, this kind of, of our society and report on it in an effective and appropriate way. And I think we're lucky in the Netherlands that we have really some excellent tech journalists there and, uh, and a vested interest of a, of a public reading such coverage. And as for NGOs, so we've seen quite some shifts over the past five years. I mean, prior to this meeting, we, we discussed what has happened in those five years. And one thing is that we see NGOs also changing, that they start Amnesty International, for instance, concerning itself uh, actively with uh, issues of artificial intelligence and human rights. To what extent is that pre breaching? Um, this is something that can really I think, from, from the perspective of, uh, of uh, our position in academia, really help building a mature digital society where we have different stakeholders, a force state that is tech savvy and able to, to ask the, the needed and hard questions about how technology is used, is able to investigate that even on a local level, don't underestimate the local aspect. So in the Netherlands, we see algorithms really deployed on a local level, like social benefit, uh, fraud, uh, detection algorithms that are used by smaller municipalities and are developed by small and medium companies locally, not the big companies that we see there. So local journalism is here important as well to ask questions about that. And then, most importantly, I think, the last mile after trained bureaucrats, people in, 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 in our uh, government sector, uh, a legal sector that is robust, uh, we, we need the last mile of stakeholders, uh, the local electives, we would say. That's something that Iris tries to approach in her work in training elected people in municipalities. And that is something I believe would build a robust and mature digital society that can deal with these challenges. There's another question. So, Yes, thank you. I, I work for a citizen engagement platform and so most of our clients are from the public sector, but we also have private orgs, and, uh, and uh, we do use AI to summarize, categorize, and give insights about all the consultations that we um, organize for the clients. And um, as you say, it's extremely difficult to say whether, especially also because we use external services to do that, um, to say whether or not the algorithm is discriminatory and somehow it's 
also we we as a tech uh, um, subcontractor uh, play a role into what tech we use and how transparent we are with the clients and the users. And so one way we kind of uh, do for now is to also um, show on the platforms which decisions have been made or categorized or summarized by an AI uh, service so that at least the person knows that he needs to, to, to pay attention to, to potential bias or something else or and uh, react to that. But in general, uh, my question is then, um, what, what level of transparency and maybe traceability, and especially in the public sector, can citizen users or clients expect or should have uh, to counter these potential bias and have a way to react? And uh, so, yeah, what's, what's, what's the expected level of transparency? Is there something already uh, in place for determining this? Or is it like or, um, on a per situation basis or something? Well, I would like to have your opinion on this. Please. Thank you. Excellent question. I think we, we had a letter by uh, uh, a Secretary of State uh, demanding transparency, unless otherwise. Um, uh, I start by, uh, with, with our lawyer here. What, what can citizens expect, uh, expect in terms of transparency? Ooh, uh... Well, I know there are a lot of uh, methods around, and I don't know anything about it. Maybe we'll be uh, ne next to me, but um, uh, oh, I see five minutes. Um, now, transparency is an important topic. Why? Because uh, without it, uh, you wouldn't know, for instance, whether or not you are uh, discriminated if you have no idea how the algorithm works. So, uh, to a certain extent, uh, transparency is needed. Uh, in the upcoming AI Act, uh, that's uh, totally uh, uh, understood, and the legislator has some uh, provisions uh, about that. However, the uh, legislator also uh, puts a lot of references to, um, are you aware of uh, something called uh, ISO norms? So those are technical norms about how you should, in this case, uh, provide transparency. And you see that the, the legislator, I think, uh, it's a person like me. Uh, once it gets uh, too technical and too detailed, it says, well, go look at the, at the delegated acts. So there will be, so we have the AI Act, but in the future we have a, we'll have a lot of surrounding delegated acts and um, ISO norms as well. Uh, and my uh, expectation is that as part of those norms, you would know as an AI uh, provider uh, to what level, or, um, uh, what level of transparency you have to maintain. But so, my answer is only uh, yes, this is a known problem, and no, we do not know yet, we lawyers do not know yet the exact details on how transparent uh, you have to be. Sorry. I don't really have a better answer. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think, like with a lot of words, transparency is a word that we use quite often, but what it really means, that's, that's very difficult. And when you start thinking about it, and when we when we are talking about transparent algorithms, you can you can think about okay the process should be transparent and, and accountable, and the, the, or you could say well the model and the behavior of the model needs to be transparent because uh, well when we look at uh, non-discriminatory uh, legislation and we need to know how the model behaves and differences between uh, demographic uh, groups. And of course, uh, when, when we are um, using the model for individual predictions and decisions, well, uh, citizens, uh, they want to contest uh, uh, those decisions and need transparency. So those are very different kinds of uh, transparency, I think. So um, yeah, I don't have a good answer either. And I, I do think that, uh, well, yeah, we need to dive into this. And, uh, and I, I also think that the standards are, are really important, and but that we should uh, not leave that to uh, a small group of, uh, yeah, of people. Lawyers. No, well, not only <laughs> lawyers. It's also people from industry. Uh, actually, there has been some criticism on the, on the development of the standards because it's not really a demographic, democratic process. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there should be more involvement, I guess. From, uh, from government, from administrators, and, and from uh, NGOs. You have a minute. Uh, there's just one small thing I wanted to add um, regarding transparency. 
since uh, the first of this month, in the Netherlands, there's um, a national algorithm register in which all, all government organizations are asked to disclose the algorithms they use, uh, which they have done. Uh, I think you, you can check it later, but I think there are over 200 on there now. Um, which really means a, a, a huge step for for public transparency. Everyone can just go on there and and, and see what kind of algorithms are used, uh, what what their purpose is. So I'm I'm very curious to see how that development uh, will go in the future and if other countries will adopt the same uh, practices. Thank you. Well, we are at the end of this panel. Thank you all very much for being here and for and the questions and the f uh, fruitful discussion we had. It has been a blast. Thank you all.